If you don't mind, can I start by asking two very of short course. questions? Um, how, uh, how, how normal is it to have dissent? The 25 members, they all have votes. There, I think under, in recent, over time that I was there, there has been quite so often dissent and there, there is really a culture of debate and it's not mm -hmm. about, the f and I would say all in all, if you look at the way they are working, uh, there was less dissent on the diagnosis, on what was not working. There was more dissent on how urgent is it and what are the major tools. Okay, uh, my other very short question is, how do you impose fiscal discipline with countries' borrowing costs so low? How does that work? <laughs> it didn't work in the United States. I'm just wondering how it works for how, how you ask a government to be disciplined fiscally if their borrowing costs are almost free. No, but as a, as, a, <laughs> as we said earlier, th this is temporary. And if you look at the, yeah, this if you is look, not temporary. <laughs> no, no, it is. If you look at the the fiscal costs now and one year ago, there is already quite a difference. It's not the same anymore. And if you only, if you only look at what happened this morning between the statement, the leak of the um, of the two parties in Italy, and how Italian rates went up, it's not. It was not the same in a Did few they hours. They hit two percent. Yes. Wow. Okay. Okay. Questions in the audience. We have people from all around Europe here, so uh, and you can ask all your questions to those three uh, people uh, in the front. Is there someone who wants to start? Okay. Please briefly introduce yourself and uh, also address your question to someone specifically. Uh, my name is Wouter Bogert. No family of uh, Hendrik, uh, just to make sure. Um, w one thing I haven't heard about is uh, globalization. Uh, Western uh, central banks uh, tend to look at their own continents, Japan, Europe, uh, Canada, the United States. It seems to me that the only way for globalizing to converge towards a more stable uh, equilibrium is by deflation. And so everybody's looking for price stability by increasing prices, but why not have controlled deflation? Well, a, a central banker would tell you that there is no such thing as controlled deflation. Um, I, I think that a lot of the, the risks associated with China becoming such a huge force, right? There's a reason that there's, a reason that there's been a, a free lunch globally. And the reason that there's been a free lunch globally for the better part of a decade was that you had 1.3 million people entered the global workforce and you had China exporting deflation at such a tremendous rate that central bankers were able to make not as, as difficult of decisions as they would have otherwise. That has ended. That has ended. So the, uh, the trade talk, the tariff talk, the nationalism, the rise of, of populist parties, a lot of this is in backlash to globalization. Um, this will make things very difficult, I think, for central bankers, if any of the rhetoric turns into war, trade war at all, I think that there is a real risk that inflation boomerangs and very quickly and very violently. And that is what we're starting to see in the United States. And we're starting to see evidence uh, of, of wage growth here on the continent that could actually get in front of, which is very unusual economically speaking, that could actually get in front of consumer price inflation here on the continent. It's a very difficult situation. Personally, I don't think that deflation is such a problem without uh, the debt problem. So, of course. Uh, we, have, we have had periods of deflation in the past, but it's a whole different story if you have huge uh, debt levels. And so the reason why central banks are so much in for creating uh, inflation is because they see the debt problem. But then I think they should be more vocal about it and not say there is a problem of inflation. They should say there is a problem of debt. And how is your strategy in the long run to reduce this? Now, the strategy, if there is a strategy, was not so successful because uh, 2008, 2018, uh, debt levels have gone up uh, tremendously, especially in China, but also in the US, also in Europe. So if there is a, a, a cunning plan to decrease uh, the debt level, I really don't see it. 
if you have really deflation, that means you will not buy today because you know prices will be, li will be lower tomorrow. What you mean is probably de disinflation, but deflation is really is a spiral that is so negative that you always postpone your decisions, and that can really be hurt everyone. So I wouldn't go for deflation. If it's a temporary disinflation with lower prices of even decreasing prices to correct, it's a different thing. But postponing always your decisions to invest, to buy, to consume, because you know it will be cheaper in, in, in one month, in two, in two months, in three months. But I think that that's also... I, I, I'm, I'm sorry for that, but it's a bit theoretical thinking because we have sectors in which we have had deflation for 30 years and notwithstanding that there is no problem of, of investing and, and being optimistic it's the ICT sector and so I don't see the issue because it's, it's a theoretical vicious circle but in reality people can deal with it so uh, take the car sector cars have become less expensive you take into account uh, technology and, and quality no problem. People will buy cars yeah, and, will, and they, they continue to buy cars. Well, no, but what you say is, is, is a bit theoretical. It's PhD uh, kind of thinking, where in reality... No, it is a crisis yeah, of the 30s. Excuse me? Well, it was well, the, it we, was we the can, crisis of we, the 30s, we, but exactly. central bank policy has run up housing prices, and, they have been, and that's a third of... I don't know what it is here in Europe. In the United States, it's 33% or more of an average household's budget. And QE in the United States has now made it to where <coughs> renting and buying are more expensive than they have ever, ever been. And therefore, with wages not keeping up with true inflation, the average household has less to spend on everything else. So they actually welcome deflation. Now, you went from, you went from about, you, you've tacked on $70 trillion of debt. In, in, in order, the central banking um, wisdom has decided that in order to solve a problem of over indebtedness, that we needed to tack on another $70 trillion of debt over the last uh, decade. That's very problematic if you have deflation, because by definition, your debts grow as a factor of time. So you have to, it, it, it's, it is an absolute trap that central banks have made for themselves because servicing $270 trillion of debt is un, it's, it's impossible if interest rates rise, much less normalize. And that's the reason why people think that interest rates will not rise, so they carry on even more debt, which is also a vicious circle, but apparently not of a, a worry. I would add on that, I think uh, misreading the, the 30s is also one of the problems, that uh, the, the fear of what happened in the 30s is, is, is so much misread that uh, we are exaggerating on, uh, on measures that would probably not have helped uh, the 30s neither. So this is Ben Bernanke's biggest legacy. Could could we we're missing a bit the the Minister of Finance because he wrote a book on Ben Bernanke. He could have added something on that, but um, again, it it it's a bit the problem when PhD starts running the whole economy, and that's what you see with the ECB. We start to transform the European economy in a planned economy. Everything is planned. Everything is controlled. And the real economy, the real impulses to take decisions, to, to invest in things with a, with a sufficient risk premium are taken away. Uh, we are fearing to lose jobs in some sectors, uh, like the financial sector, and in that way we are indeed prolonging uh, the effects of the crisis because we don't create enough in the new sectors. And it's all happening in front of our eyes, and I don't say that this is all uh, because of the ECB policy, but the ECB policy is a big problem in it because it's postponing all the necessary, most necessary uh, measures to make uh, the European economy more competitive and more f uh, forward-looking instead of uh, backwards-looking. Okay. We have another question here, and then I will come to the front. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Wout from SAS. Um, it's a lot going, going around in my head, but it seems like you all say interest rates will rise. And as far as I've, uh, yeah, it's not possible, but at the same time, they have to rise. But isn't it true that the American government is going to put more uh, of their uh, inventory on the market? So that will push rights up. At the same time, I've heard a rumor about the IMF going to dump 10-year uh, bonds, American bonds. I haven't bonds. heard that rumor yet. And um, yeah, it looks, it looks like... Um, Maybe I'm the conspiracy person here, but no, it no, looks like there's you're, no you're way out. You're not alone, I promise. Okay, there's no way out. And I think that uh, the real 
rich people in the world, they know what's happening. And I think that everything has to go back to the real intrinsic value. And then, yeah, gold, silver, blah, blah, blah. But it, it's all paper. It's Everything is paper. And like, I'm just a guy from the street, but he's, he's talking about uh, prices not inflating. Nah, it's it's crazy. I've bought a, a small apartment. I'm a small entrepreneur. Small apartment for rental. It went from seventy-eight thousand to one hundred and forty thousand in about three years. So you tell me about rising prices, and now everybody thinks, oh, it's cheap. Uh, rates are low. Blah blah blah. But they will go back up, and then then that's when the pain comes. It's not a temporary drug. Rock you and yeah. So are you asking if interest rates are going to rise? Yeah. Yes. Well, um, right Blue now flags, we're flags. Right, right now we're seeing it play out live in, in the markets. Yesterday was the highest close on the ten year bond, the highest close on the two year bond that we've seen. Unfortunately we're seeing a very rapid flattening of our interest rate curve as well. In other words, short uh, yielding rates are, are, are meeting long yielding rates, uh, sent the central bankers' worst nightmare. Um, because it, it begins to reflect the inability of the economy to withstand the higher interest rates. So, um, you know, what, what is happening in the United States, we have led the rest of the world in terms of normalizing monetary policy. It looks like we're going to, it looks like we're going to lead the rest of the world in terms of interest rates rising as well. And that's not good news. Just a question on that, uh, because we try to let's say, influence the markets. One of the things that has been suggested in the past is that the Fed has a plunge protection team. Oh, the PPP. Yeah. Is that true or not? It's mentioned in the book. Um, it's not... Um, from, from everything that I understand right now, the, the, the plunge protection team is not engaged. Um, in, in fact, I think if there's something that is fairly remarkable about Jay Powell, um, it is that he is not a member of the Group of 30. And I applaud everybody in the economic committee community who questioned Mario Draghi's being a member of the Group of 30. But Jay Powell, his first day in office, the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average lost over 1,000 points. Um, and it, as a reaction to that, he did absolutely nothing. Any of, any of his predecessors, any of his three predecessors would have come out with an emergency statement and emergency measures and the Fed has your back and we're there for you. Jay Powell understands markets. He understands that markets are supposed to price risk. And in subsequent testimony to Congress, he said as much. He said that it is not the central bank's job to put a floor underneath stock prices. And you can just imagine, there I was watching TV, barking like a seal, jumping up and down, really happy, tweeting it out, taking pictures. I was, it was, but it was a moment, it was a watershed moment because if you change the philosophy of central bankers, if one man can start changing this philosophy and be able to say it's okay for the markets to go back to being volatile, There'll be a line in the sand that's drawn. Jay Powell's not going to let the real economy fall into recession. But so far, we don't have signs that the real economy has been harmed yet. But when you have that kind of a, a shift, you know, after you've been inside for almost a decade, as I was, you begin to finally see a glimmer of light in the distance that maybe we're finally going to have a change in thinking on the global stage among the central bankers. So that was my advertisement for Mr. Powell. OK, another question. Thank you. Eric Kenan, a private shareholder of the Central Bank of Belgium. I think, and I attend many conferences, I think we make the problem a little bit too hard to understand. The conclusions of all the committees in the world after the outbreak of the financial crisis in 2008 were very simple. Crisis was a result of too much debt and too low interest rates to cover the risks of that debt. Yeah? Now, we are solving a problem of too much debt and too low interest rates by creating much more debt and much lower interest rates. Yeah? That is like getting your cellar, which is half full of water, dry by putting more water in that cellar. That's a very complicated thing to do. So. What I heard here today also, and Sander opened today with a remark, like um, 
the, the past financial crisis and, and whatever. It is the current financial crisis. And it's so easy to understand that that financial crisis becomes worse every day. As long as those central banks keep doing the wrong thing, the crisis becomes worse. And it's not a problem of putting a floor under the stock market. The problem is to put the floor under the bond, bond market. Because stock market, then we're talking about real assets. The bond market, we're talking about thin air. And let's make the, the problem as easy as it is and try to understand the consequences. Okay, I know there's a question coming. Oh, no, no, no. It was, a, it was an observation. Okay, questions, no observations. Uh, Peter Kleppe, I'm with Open Europe, Think Tank. Um, question for uh, Mr. Rotir. Um, at uh, the last uh, event hosted by Leergeld, um, there was um, Professor Lex Hoogduin, who has been the uh, advisor to the first president of the European Central Bank, Mr. Duisenberg. And um, he said that um, at the beginning, uh, the ECB, their 2%, wasn't the target. So it, w it didn't see 2% as something desirable to reach but it, it saw it as some kind of a, a maximum, um, um, according to him, and I looked it up, it's a bit unclear, uh, the ECB has uh, de facto shifted to uh, considering 2% as a target, as some kind of a, a desirable goal. Now, my question is that if you have 10,000 euro, you can calculate it after 10 years or so. If you have consistently 2% per year inflation, you only have effectively, I think it's 8,300 euro or something uh, left. Now, <laughs> how is that a good thing? And um, doesn't it prove that that um, a lot of the thinking surround it, uh, surrounding central bank policy uh, that sort of endorses having 2% as a, as a target uh, is basically a fig leaf um, and that the real goal is, of course, uh, to, to make sure that indebted government um, can, uh, can solve their problem to a certain degree. Uh, no, Lex Hogan is right. I think it's shortly after he's, he left in 2004. I don't know the exact date, but that then they decided to have a target. Initially, it was between 0 and 2, and then they went to close to but below 2%. And they could have chosen 0% or 0 0.5. But if you choose, and saying then you have price stability at that level. But if you chose a, le a floor like, let's say, 0 0.3, whatever shock you have, you will be negative. And then immediately, you will. how do you tackle that? Do you go to negative interest rates? Do you go to, very quickly, you have much less tools. So having this margin of 2%, my understanding, it, it allows, if it's credible, you have a credible target, and it allows you suffi a sufficient margin to react with, with the available tools. And even under the current crisis, the ECB was even forced to use other tools. But going then to your question about um, about your 10,000 10, and what you le what you left over, what you need to look at for that is the real interest rate. Is what what is the nominal interest rate you have minus the inflation rate? And here, the real interest rate is low. But it isn't the lowest in the last 25 or 30 years. If you look at the inflation rate years ago, and the, and the nominal rate you had at that time, was, the real rate was much lower, and the loss you had on your, on your savings on what you had there was much more important than what you have here. Here, the real interest rate for the moment is slightly negative. It is negative, but it is not as negative as it was, and I hope it's temporary. Someone else who wants to... Comment on the last issue? No? Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Jan Musgold. I'm a former banker and also a writer. Um, I have the impression that you're no fan of negative interest rates or low interest rates and also not of large uh, asset purchases. But I was wondering in times that um, there's a drop in aggregate, ag aggregate demand. How should the Fed or the ECB stimulate the economy? 
Well, um, you're, you're right. I'm not a fan of negative interest rates. Um, zero interest rates caused enough distortions, and zero interest rates caused enough malinvestment that our country is going to take a very long time to get over it after the next recession. Um, I can only imagine what negative interest rates will do here, but I'm, I mean, I'm, all I can say is I'm sorry. Um, it's very difficult for central banks right now. One of the reasons that the, the Federal Reserve is trying so hard to get to two and a half, two and three quarters percent, they probably won't get there before we're in, re we're in recession. But one of the reasons that they're trying to get somewhere close to the neutral rate is so that they do have traditional conventional tools to use in the event that the, that, that the economy goes into recession. Um, you know, I think it's an open debate. Everything that I've read that Jay Powell has said about quantitative easing, he's very, he's, he's very skeptical of its value. Most of the papers that were done in the United States, of course, the, the quantitative easing years, we averaged 1.9% um, GDP. So the, the, the marginal benefit that we got for each dollar of, of printing um, decreased as a factor of time. Um, you know, I, I think it might be time for a reset of thinking because unconventional monetary policy, uh, as I said in my concluding remarks, has done more harm than good. Uh, I think it's time to close the unconventional box and go back to just using whatever tools that you might happen to have uh, in the convention, which is just interest rates. And that it would, it would force the onus, actually, in such a situation. It would force the fiscal authorities, as opposed to taking advantage and exploiting central bank policy, to their own good, it would force governments to make some very tough decisions. So, would like to add that nothing beats prevention, because you shouldn't end up in such a situation. And one of the reasons why we we end up in such a, such a situation is because we overestimate, for instance, potential growth. Now, if you start adding models with potential growth too high, you 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 don't see that in in fact you you're creating a, a spend up demand that people overspend course, then the debt kicks in, etc. So um, you consistently see that in the models used by central banks, but also by planning agencies, etc. Our uh, aging commission, commission also for the pensions, that they overestimate growth. A lot of problems come if you overestimate growth over very long periods. You, you misalign with, with uh, correct targets. And, and when you see something happening, you, you overreact again because you start adding stimulus where you, you, you can't reach the level that you're aiming at. And that's one of the problems if, if, uh, if there would be more prevention and also uh, thinking about um, their assumptions, their underlying assumptions, we would get a more healthy uh, uh, central banking policy. And so that's what one of the, the things when, when you, you start talk, talking to the, the research departments of, uh, of central banks, planning agencies, etc., they are so much in their silo that they can't understand that some of their assumptions are wrong. And again, the market is then a good reference because the market has some very different assumptions on a lot of their uh, numbers. Uh, so confronting a confrontation with the market is always healthy, but if you then influence the markets, you're influencing the thermometer that you should watch at. Um, I, I think it, it feels like we're about to wrap up. So you use the term firefighter so many times that I would be remiss to not share my favorite one-liner. Um, this is by Jim Grant, who's long been an economist, financial markets expert. And I, so I, I won't steal his, his thunder, but his favorite way to describe central bankers is that they're both arsonists and firemen. Okay. We're running out of time. If there are still some questions left, I would advise you to um, talk to the speakers at the reception, for example. Uh, and I want to ask for a big applause for our three panel uh, <laughs> debaters for today. Daniele Di Martino-Boot, Geert Nuls, and Stefan Rottier. Yeah.